paragraph one on page 163, what is Jehovah's view of blood? Jehovah told his worshippers in Bible times, the life of every sort of flesh is its blood. Leviticus 17, 14. To Jehovah, blood represents life. Since life is sacred or holy gift from God, blood is also sacred. However, if you read the next verse, Leviticus 17, 15, it explains that those who broke God's law on blood, who broke the commandment on blood, they were to be cut off until evening. All they had to do was have a ceremonial bath, wash their clothes and their body in this ceremonial bath, and then they came back to the clamp camp uh, clean. Um, I'll read from the end of verse 13. You shall not eat the blood of any flesh, for the life of all flesh is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. Verse 15. And every person who eats what died naturally or what was torn by beasts, so it hasn't been drained, okay? Whether he is a native of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Then he shall be clean. So the penalty for breaking God's law on blood wasn't to be disfellowshipped as Jehovah's Witnesses do, where no one speaks to you if you have a blood transfusion and you're not repentant. The shepherd, the flock of God's book says you're to be disfellowshipped if you willingly take it and you're not repentant. Um, you're, you're simply cut off until evening, until you have a ceremonial bath. I would like, I would like to say what I know. I won't say what I don't know. And I only say the truth. There has never been anybody, Jehovah's Witness, disfellowshipped because he or she take blood. That's not true. Such you know that's not true. Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses have been disfellowshipped because they willingly took a blood transfusion and they were not repentant about it. People who take a blood transfusion and are repentant, according to the Shepherd of the Flock book, they're to lose privileges. Please, do you know, do you have anybody in your contacts? I beg your pardon? Is there anyone in your contact that was disfellowship because of taking blood? I, I, I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, I've never been one. But the Shepherd the Flock of God book says that if a person is unrepentant, they have a blood transfusion willingly. They're not unconscious. They choose to have a blood transfusion. When confronted by the elders, they are not repentant. They are, then they are to be disfellowshipped. That's in the Shepherd the Flock of God book. How do you know Shepherd book? Well, it's, not it's, it's because it's all over the Internet. It's easy to download it. Trouble is, it changes every few months. There's a new edition. I guess okay, they now, do that to confuse the, question, the courts. The question is now, uh, do you know the net adjustment respecting the paragraph you're quoting from? Well, could, you know you, could, could you just respond to Leviticus 17.15? Why don't Jehovah's Witnesses have ceremonial baths to... Um, you know, remove the sin of having blood if you believe you're under this Levitical curse. Why don't Jehovah's Witnesses have ceremonial washings? As the Bible commands in Leviticus 17:15, if you believe you're under the Levitical law on blood, then the cure in Leviticus 17:15 is to have a ceremonial bath. You you wash your clothes and you wash your body, and then you're clean. Why don't Jehovah's Witnesses do what the Bible says? Um, this is the law given to the nation of Israelites. Uh, and uh, how, does, uh, uh, how does this law? Listen, I'm talking. Are you speaking close to the mic? Maybe if you speak further away from the phone, maybe that's why it's very hard to understand you. Okay. This is the law given to the Israelites at their time. And how does it affect us today? Well, that it, is what it doesn't. It doesn't because the law on blood. Here is a ceremonial law on blood. It's got nothing to do with Christians in 2024. So none of it applies to us today. I'm saying something you don't want me to come out. I'm saying, how does this concern, how does it affect us today? Then I wanted to quote from the Greek scripture, what this Greek scripture says to us as Christians. 
Acts chapter 15, 28 yeah. and 29. Let's, let, by all means, let's go there. But before we do, could you address Leviticus seventeen fifteen? Please don't make no comment on this verse. Comment on the verse oh, before you go on to another verse. Oh, so we deal with this oh, verse. Do you believe Christians today in 2024 are under the blood, um, the blood laws of, of the Mosaic law? Yes or no? Because if it's no, then I will agree with you. And therefore the ceremonial washing doesn't apply because there's no restriction on blood today. The ceremonial birth does not apply or uh, there's no indication of such in Christian uh, Greek scripture. That's why I wanted to read what applies to us in Acts chapters 15, 28 and 29. Let's see what the place says. According to the decision made by the elders in the first century Christians, I think it will be practical if we can look into the scripture and see what he says respecting blood. Can we do that? Um, in Acts 10, you have Gentiles coming into the church. The Gentiles had several practices that the Jews found offensive. So this is not a commandment for the entire history of the Christian church. This is just something for that situation where the Gentiles had certain practices that the Jews found <laughs> offensive. It so only in, applies to Gentiles, right? Is that what you're saying? I beg your pardon? Are you trying to say that the place I'm talking about only applies to Gentiles? No. In the, the, the church was Jewish in Acts 2. They were Jews. They're the ones who became Christians. In Acts 8, you had Samaritans who came in. They became Christians. In Acts 10, you had Gentiles who became Christians. So in Acts 15, there was a church council with the apostles and the elders because the Gentile people who'd become Christians had certain practices, certain things that they did with the, which the Jews found offensive. So the, the point isn't this is some commandment for the entire history, 2000 year history of the church age. This is just something that they sorted out in Acts 15. So the Gentile converts didn't offend the Jews. It says in verse 27. Uh, no, verse 28, Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. This is to the Gentile converts who, who, who join the Christian church. That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you would do well, farewell. Well, I don't offer things to idols. I don't have an idol in my flat, and I, I offer things to my, to my idol. Because the context for this verse is the early first, it's the mid first century. It's Gentiles who've come into the church and it's saying, look, Gentiles, don't do these things because they're offensive to the Jews. It would be rather like if some punk rockers. OK, have you done it? Have you heard of punk rockers? No. Well, they're white people from the 1970s, young white kids uh, in in England and, and then America. They put safety pins in their noses and safety pins in their mouths. Okay. And they wore black studded leather coats and they spat a lot. They spat on the floor and they had long spiky hair. Now, if you converted Jehovah's Witnesses to your um, Jehovah's Witness faith and they came to your kingdom hall, you would find it very offensive if they kept spitting on the floor all the time. That's something that you wouldn't like as a Jehovah's Witness. It's not a sin to spit on the floor. It's just a dirty habit. So you would say to these punk rockers, Please, punk rockers, you've now become Jehovah's Witnesses. Please don't spit on the floor. Wear a suit and tie. Take the safety pins out of your nose. Don't wear those black leather studded uh, jackets. Put on suits and ties. Or if you're a female, wear a dress. OK, and don't spit on the floor because it's offensive to us. That's the situation in Acts 15. It, it was dealing with cultural issues that the Jews found offensive. It's not a hard and fast law that's um, for the entire 2000 year history of the Christian church. It's just dealing with the situation in Acts 15 of problems with Gentile 
converts who've come into the church. So, what was the issue between the Gentile and the Jews as at that time? Well, I've just I've just read it to you. There were certain practices that they did. There were various sexual practices. They were eating blood. They were offering uh, things to idols. Okay, these things were offensive to the Jews. So this church council was to rule on these issues, and to ask the Gentiles not to do these things because they're offensive to the Jews. The Jews already know God's command, respecting blood. Yeah, but that doesn't Eating. stand. That doesn't stand. Because in the church age, you don't have Christians offering bulls and goats in their churches. You didn't bring a bull or a goat to your church to sacrifice. And then you poured the blood out from the sacrifice on the ground. That was under the old covenant. Christians don't sacrifice bulls and goats. So the Old Testament Leviticus law doesn't apply to Christians. So, like I'm saying, the Jews, the Jews convert into Christianity. When they see the Gentiles coming into uh, the congregation, they were like, Oh, these people are not circumcised. It's now become a, a, a problem that before they will rightly belong with them, they have to be circumcised. And that is where the issue came up. So when the elders... We're talking about blood, not circumcision. Um, have you heard of the principle of Halakha in, in Judaism? H A L A K H A Halakha. Have you heard of it? It told me the other day. Right. Okay. It's the principle of the preservation of life. Have we actually done blood transfusions before? Have we looked at blood transfusions? I speak to so many people. You, you, you see, I have a problem. <laughs> have we done blood transfusions before? Me? Yeah. No, okay. So I wouldn't have mentioned the halakha to you before then. It's the first time I've mentioned it to you. Do you know what the principle of halakha is? You say the principle of preservation of life. Right, so I have mentioned this to you before. You did. Right, so have we done blood transfusions before? I have not. You have And I will never intend. I don't understand you, you know. I find I've never, it... never done need and I will never intend to. N never intend to what? Do blood transfusion. Anyway, look, I... Halakha is the principle of preservation of life. Okay, if, if you're I'm... in if you're in Holland in 1914, you're hiding Jews in the basement. If the Gestapo, that's the Nazi police, call and say, Zah, do you have Jews in the basement? Are you hiding the Jews? What do you do? Because however you answer, you'll be breaking one of the commandments. If you lie and say, no, I don't have Jews, you're breaking the ninth commandment. You're telling a lie, but you're saving a life. If you tell the truth, yes, I do have Jews there. Then you're guilty of their murder and the Nazis will probably kill you as well. So you, you're guilty of murder and suicide. So you can't win. So in the principle of Halakha, that's the principle of the preservation of life in Judaism. What happens is that to preserve a human life is paramount. So if you have to tell a lie to say to save a life, then that's permissible in Judaism. In the same way that if a, an animal or a child falls down a well, you don't let it drown on the Sabbath day. Okay, the Sabbath is rest. But if a child or an animal falls down a well, even an animal, you're to break the Sabbath and try to save its life because of the principle of Halakha. And this principle of Halakha applies to blood transfusions. If a child needs a medical procedure which requires blood, then it's not a sin to have a blood transfusion if it saves a life. It is, however, a sin, in my opinion, 
for Jehovah's Witnesses elders in the hospital liaison committee to um, to deny a blood transfusion. Could I just ask, are you from Ghana? Are you the guy from Ghana? No. Nigeria? Kenya? Yes. What, Nigeria? Yeah. Ni Ni Nigeria. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, are, are you also aware that under the Levitical law, according to Deuteronomy 14.21, Gentiles were allowed under the Levitical law to eat but blood? Uh, Leviticus 14, chapter 14, verse 21. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates that he may eat it or you may sell it to a foreigner. For I, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. So under the Levitical law, Jews were allowed to give or sell meat that had not been bled, it contained blood, to non-Jews. Now, if you and I travelled back in time, three and a half thousand years, we would be the, the alien within the gates. We'd be the stranger. We'd be the non-Jews. And under the, the Levitical law, we would be permitted to eat blood. So, so why has so why have Jehovah's Witnesses forbidden blood and forbidden blood transfusions since 1945? They allowed them from 1879 to 19 to the early part of 1945, but part way through 1945 to today, they they forbid them. Why? Why they forbid it? And why they took it in here before now? Is that what your question is? C could you say that again, please? Why they forbid it now? And why they took it in here before now? Is that what your question is? Why do Jehovah's Witnesses forbid blood? I'm not under because the Levitical law, nor are you. The ceremonial devil. law has the ceremonial law and the laws for the nation of Israel have gone. They they don't apply today. The Bible emphatically stressed that we should abstain from blood. Where? Do you want to know where it is? You're not going to go to Acts, Acts 15, 27 and 28, no, because no, I explained no, that no. and you had no response. You never respond to anything, you see? No. God's law is forever standing and doesn't change. Do you want to see 50 places Hang in the on. Bible where... You, you said that God's you said that God's law does not change. Do you, when I'm you said talking, you said God's law does not change. But ten minutes ago, you said that God changed His mind on circumcision. Jews were supposed to be circumcised, and then the converts who came into the Christian church were not circumcised. When I'm talking, you don't do the next thing. When you are talking, I will listen to you. I don't know. I don't know how to do such. I want to. Can I? Can you be talking about this thing? I wouldn't prefer it. Because if I want to say something, you won't allow me. I want to listen to you only. Can it be better than that? Um, Jehovah's Witnesses do not abstain from blood. Since the 1980s, there's been a strong relaxation on blood. And blood can be separated into its constituent parts, red and white blood cells, platelets and blood plasma. There's a picture of that on one, page 165. You spin blood in a test tube and it, 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 um, it will come out in its constituent parts, heaviest at the bottom, red blood cells, and lightest blood, blood plasma at the top. Since the 1980s, Jehovah's Witnesses have been permitted to have fractions from all of these, fractions from plasma, fractions from white blood cells, fractions from platelets, fractions from red blood cells. So they were banned before 1980, but at various times during the 1980s, these have been permitted, or not at the same time, at different, different dates during the 1980s. They're all now a conscience matter. So Jehovah's Witnesses can imbibe every part of blood Jehovah's Witnesses can take into their body plasma, white blood cells, platelets, red blood cells as fractions. 
provided it's not at the same time as blood. It has to be separated into its constituent parts, stored, and then a Jehovah's Witness one year could have fractions from plasma. Next year, they could go to hospital and have fractions from white blood cells. Then they could come back another time and have fractions from platelets. And finally, they could go to hospital in 10 years' time and have fractions from red blood cells. So Jehovah's Witnesses do imbibe every part of blood into their body, but provided it's separated, and then they imbibe it as, as fractions, you see. It's a bit hypocritical. It's a, it's a bit like someone saying, you are not allowed to have a, a cheese sandwich. But if you separate the cheese sandwich into its constituent parts, bread, butter and cheese, you can eat these separately. You can eat cheese separately, then you can have some butter, then you can eat some bread. But you can't put them all together and eat a cheese sandwich. That's a sin. God forbid you to eat a cheese sandwich. But you can have it separately. You can have cheese and then the next day you have butter and the next day you have bread. It's just not consistent, sir. Can, can you see that? Are you, are you, are you, are you there? I'm here. Could you respond? I, I'm almost cut off by sleep, seriously. All right. Well, the final thing is you can't store blood according to the Watchtower. Watchtower, 15th of October, 2000, page 30 and 31. Trouble with that is fractions are stored. So before people take fractions into their body, these fractions are stored for several weeks or, or even months. Now, this watchtower says you can't store blood. <laughs> but Jehovah's Witnesses can take every part of blood into their body. And those fractions are stored, which the watchtower says you can't do. There's just no consistency there. And it leads to people's deaths. You see? How, how can this be a teaching from God? It, it breaks the principle of halakha, the preservation of human life. If somebody needs a medical procedure, and I would try not to have a blood transfusion, but if it was absolutely necessary to save my life, I would have one. And I do so in good rather, conscience. It's I not rather, a sin. Robert, let me tell you this. I mean, suppose I have a medical condition under which blood is needed for me to survive. I'd rather die rather than taking blood. It's my decision, my personal decision. I get to me. So you have no question or whatever to talk about that. Yeah, but whatever you, person decides yep. is his business. So I choose to do so. But you because don't. of my relationship with Jehovah. No, you don't if choose you, to do so. You're told what to do. You're told what to do by by the elders. They really control you like a puppet. Nobody controls me. Right, well, uh, show me, show me in the Bible where it Probably says you can't have a blood transfusion. It. Show me in the Bible where it says you can't have a blood transfusion. My decision. Yes, of course it is. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't encourage other people to do the same because it's murder. If you encourage other people to do the same, then you are a murderer. You're guilty of encouraging people to commit suicide. That is a sin. That's murder. Christians should always try to preserve life, the principle of Halakha. And whoever that want to save his life will lose it. Have you read that from the scripture? Have I read what? Whoever that want to save his life will lose it. But whoever that loses his life will save it. You, you, you know... What you, are, what you are trying to imply that somebody should disobey God's law. That is... But that somebody should what? What, what am I saying? Sense. Be clear. What am I saying? What are you accusing me of saying? You are, you are quoting from the principle of Malachi. It's evident demonstration of the fact that we should obey human principle rather than God's word. So I will obey where's, God's where's, principle. Where's that in the Bible? So just human. say that. Just say that again. You, it's very hard to understand you. Could you say that again clearly and then show me where? Were you quoting a Bible verse? Perhaps you could just say it again and give me the Bible reference. 
how many Bible reference do you want to be clear? Every time you quote the Bible, give the Bible reference beforehand so I can turn there and see if you're quoting the Bible accurately. You saw it clearly from your own scripture out there. That's Acts chapter 15, 28 and 29. Say, abstain. And you know what it means to abstain. Suppose, for example, so, somebody so has you, medical So condition. you're saying you that... Oh, oh. You don't want me to talk. Oh my God. I'm not talking. I'm listening. I'm listening. Well, go on. You, uh, you like to interrupt uh, the other person. I will give you time to express yourself. Well, whenever I want to come up with something, we are learning. Remember, we are learning. We are not. I'm not arguing to win. Next thing, I'm not arguing to win. But yeah, I want good, to watch you know. <laughs> Are you hearing me? I'm not arguing. What's your What's your point on Acts fifteen twenty seven and twenty eight? My point is that God said that we should abstain from blood. We shouldn't take blood. But who's he? But who's he speaking to? <laughs> Firstly, it's the elders and the um, apostles who are speaking. So, who are they speaking to? Why is he recorded? It's he's not inspired. Those in that spoke was not God. He's not God. He's not the God. Through them spoke. God through them spoke. And what they spoke was written. written. And why was it written? Because it is from God. It is inspired. It is by the direction of the Holy Spirit. So, are you trying to say it comes from them? Whatever that is in the Bible did not come from anyone's thought. Look. Look. Um... Abraham paid a tithe of money and, 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 sorry, goods to Melchizedek. He gave, it was actually spoils of, spoils of war. Just because Abraham did this doesn't mean that all Christians today have to do the same thing. Abraham also offered a burnt offering. He saw a ram caught in a thicket in Genesis twenty-two sixteen. And he took it by the horns and he, ordered it and he offered it on a burnt altar. Now, just because Abraham offered a, a burnt offering doesn't mean that we have to do it just because it's in the Bible. The context for Genesis twenty two sixteen is the situation with Abraham. It's not something for the entire history of the entire Christian church that we have to do everything that uh, Abraham did. Um... I mean, Noah built an ark. Does that mean that I should build an ark? Should all Christians build an ark? You know, should we all be, be building arks in our backyard? You know, um, 400 cubits long or whatever the length was. You know, because Noah did it. So must, must we build an ark? Come on, that's obtuse. In Acts 15, the context is there was this, there was this dispute in Jerusalem concerning the Gentiles and their practices that they'd come into the church and so the apostles and the elders got together and it says in verse 28 for it seemed good to the holy to to it seemed good to the holy spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden and then it goes through the things that they found offensive the the context is the church in Jerusalem in about AD I think it would be about AD 50 maybe AD 55, sometime around then. Uh, it, it, it's dealing with the offensive practices that the Gentiles did. This isn't a sort of prescription. It's a description. It's a description of the situation. It's a description of how they um, sorted it out. I mean, I mean, look, the Bible, the, the Bible um, says that if we need to go to the toilet and we need to defecate, we're supposed, to, we're supposed to go out in the field, dig into the field, uh, do our business and then cover it. Now, I'm sure you break that commandment every day. And I break that commandment every day because I sit on the toilet and I press a flush where water clears all the mess away. I'm not doing what the Bible says. 
because the commandment wherever it is about defecating in a field in a hole in a field you dig a hole you do your business in the hole and then you cover it that's for israel mate that's not a commandment for people in 2024 and nor is acts 15 the situation is the church the early church in about ad 45 ad 50 and maybe ad 55 sometime around then that's the situation and for you to use this out of context verse he's hung up or you know i mean i, I it's just unbelievable um this leads to people's lives people are dead because of the jehovah's witness commandment on blood i mean they're they're a bunch of muppets the uh, watchtower bible and track society leaders um in 1967 they even banned organ transplants in one of the watchtowers this followed the first heart transplant by the south african surgeon christian bernard so jehovah's witnesses and the watchtower banned all transplants as cannibalism they banned organ transplants of kidney liver heart and cornea transplants i mean it's absolute people died and then they reversed their policy in 1980 jehovah's witnesses are frankly responsible for the murder of tens of thousands of people because of their policy on blood transfusions and organ transplants they are complete and utter hypocrites and you saw the, this guy had a chance to prepare and he's a complete joke he, he doesn't know the first thing at all about his own faith and that's what they're all like i'm nearly up to three thousand discussions and it is unbelievable these people do not know what they are talking about it really is unbelievable they are they are wasting their life and they're wasting the lives of other people and part of the problem for that is that they just do not dialogue with people uh, so many religious people um, there's all sorts of problems in the uk um, with um, an immigrant community in the uk at the moment i don't want to do anything to inflame the situation i think it's terrible to see people um virtually rioting a terrible situation but part of the problem for this is because people don't talk there is no real communication here in the uk the government just shuts down dialogue they shut down debate um, nothing is supposed to be discussed the problems that exist in british society should be discussed they're not they're just swept under the table and people are getting more and more angry because for decades they're not being listened to and they will never be listened to um, anyway i'm not talking to this guy again and you never you would you would not believe how this guy pesters you all the time with endless text messages uh, despite my asking please don't pester me with text messages he will agree a time and he won't keep to that time and um, he just phones whenever and it's it's very very difficult um, so i think i'm going to put this guy on block because i have had so many text messages for him i i really don't want to talk to him again